Fox Kids was a children's programming block that launched on September 8, 1990 and ended September 7, 2002. According to James B. Stewart's book Disney War, all of this is tied to the launching of the Disney Afternoon. DuckTales was the start of the Disney Afternoon and it launched in September of 1987 and aired in syndication including on Fox owned and operated stations as well as many of its affiliates. After a station in LA wanted to show DuckTales and took it from the local Fox station, this made Fox pull DuckTales from all Fox owned stations and encouraged their affiliates to do the same due to a breach of contract. Disney went ahead and launched the Disney Afternoon and Fox created Fox Kids to fill the programming gaps. Many of us fondly remember playing the Disney Afternoon video games, but what about the Fox Kids ones? I'm the ex-hardcore gamer and today I'm going to be talking about 7 Fox Kids shows that also had video games. Now don't change the channel just yet, but when you have a chance feel free to go over to patreon.com slash idreamofindiegames. Over there you'll find out what you can do to help support us here at I Dream of Retro Games as well as over at the main channel I Dream of Indie Games. The Patreons are pretty much just tied together and there are multiple tiers to help support that fit your budget. You'll gain access to our Discord server, early access to some videos, maybe even some games depending on what tier that you pick. So again, go over to patreon.com slash I Dream of Indie Games and you can help support us today. So for today's list on Fox Kids Games, it's not going to be a complete list. I tried not to include things that started or ended elsewhere because then the list would just get too big. So in other words, no Tiny Toons or Funhouse because those started in syndication. No Animaniacs or Batman the Animated Series because those later on went to the WB. First up on the list is Attack of the Killer Tomatoes. Attack of the Killer Tomatoes was one of the first shows shown on Fox Kids. It ran for two seasons from 1990 to 1991 and was based on the 1978 Attack of the Killer Tomatoes as well as the sequel Return of the Killer Tomatoes released in 1988. The plot follows a boy named Chad who's a 10 year old pizza boy, yes that's right 10 years old, yay child labor, who has a friend named Tara who happens to be a human tomato hybrid because in this world tomatoes have been banned after the Great Tomato War and there's an evil scientist named Dr. Putrid T. Gangrene who created Tara as a weird experiment. She may look like a human but she'll turn into a tomato when hit with salt but can turn back when hit with with Pepper. Man, Burger Time would have been a great tie-in for this cartoon. There were two video game tie-ins released for Attack of the Killer Tomatoes, the first one being on the NES in 1991. It was developed by Imagineering, which is famous for making the A Boy and His Blob games, as well as many other licensed games, and they were previously mentioned in our History of Double Dragon video as they were the ones responsible for making the ports for both the Atari 2600 and the 7800. Published by THQ, which probably isn't a surprise because they made all kinds of licensed games, Attack of the Killer Tomatoes was a 2D platform game. You could jump on the heads of the tomatoes and they would splat, run away, or become smaller. Unfortunately, this jumping has bad hit detection and floaty controls, all with annoying sound. <laughs> The Game Boy version was released later on in 1992, and while it has the same cover, it is a different game from a different developer. This time it was made by Equilibrium, which only made a handful of games before disappearing. You're gonna be playing as Wilbur, who is Chad's uncle that owns the pizzeria that he works for who happens to also be a veteran of the Great Tomato War. This game is a bit more of a straightforward platformer, but also has the added ability of fighting back. Instead of just jumping on their heads, you can punch and kick them, but you also have rocks to smash and other kinds of things that actually made this game a bit more fun. It's still not great, but between the two versions, it's still the more fun game to play. Next up on the list is Bobby's World, which ran for seven seasons from September 9th, 1990 to February 23rd, 1998. This would make it the longest running Fox Kids show that will be on this list. It was created by Howie Mandel because yes, he was a comedian and actor before hosting America's Got Talent and Deal or No Deal, and he voiced both Bobby and the father Howard. Bobby's world was about a young boy with a very active imagination, so this could lend itself to making a good video game at least in theory. A video game was in fact made for the Super Nintendo back in 1995, with the Genesis version supposedly in development but never released, 
but I don't think that the Super Nintendo version ever got an official release either. There are some cartridges floating around out there, but each one does look different from each other, which just leads me to believe that the leaked prototype was just burned onto a cartridge for you. Bobby's World was developed by Rydell Software Productions, which specialize in edutainment and children's properties but they also did the famous Spy vs. Spy video game. They eventually spun off into Running With Scissors, which are the infamous makers of Postal. The publisher on record is High Tech Entertainment, but they did close in 1995, which probably led to the fact that this game was never released. They did publish lots of kids' property games, so it seemed right up their alley. In Bobby's World, the video game, Bobby's mother tells him to clean his room, and while doing so, he daydreams about a toy. Each level is based on a different toy daydream. This mostly is a platforming game with some shoot 'em up levels to break it up a bit. This variety, as well as its bright colorful graphics and fantastic music, helped this be one of the best games on the list today. What brings it down a bit, though, is the fact that it's a relatively short and easy game, especially since you can adjust the lives and continues. But be that as it may, it's not really one you can hunt down since it wasn't officially released, but there are other ways out there for you to play it. Third on the list today is Tasmania, which actually has a few games to go along with it. Tasmania ran for four seasons from 1991 to 1995 and follows Taz the Tasmanian Devil from Looney Tunes. It's all about his adventures in Tasmania, and that's the fictional Tasmania with a Z, not an S. The first Tasmania game that gained some popularity that at least I played as a kid was the Genesis game that came out in 1992. Developed by Recreational Brainware, which as far as I can tell, this was their one and only game, and published by Sega, making this an exclusive game for the Sega Genesis. Taz is told a story by his father about a huge giant seabird that laid eggs that were so big that it could feed a family of Tasmanian devils for a whole year. He's told that there's a place where they still live, and Taz sets out to find the giant eggs to make a giant omelet. It plays as a 2D side-scrolling platformer as you look for the birds and their eggs. You can jump, spin, and eat things, but there is a bit of exploration to make it a bit different from some of the other platforming games that you would play in that era. Right away, you'll notice that it has nice large sprites and graphics that are pretty colorful for a Genesis game. It almost looks like it would be more of a Super Nintendo game. Unfortunately, this color does make the game bog down a bit, and it wasn't as fun as I remembered it as a kid. Even old gamer Joe agreed that we were quite shocked. We thought this was going to be one of the better games on the list, and it was a bit boring. The exploration is actually more about trial and error and finding out what will and won't kill you. This means that you have to kind of memorize where to go in each level, and it's just not as fun as it should be. This game was also ported to the Game Gear and Master System, albeit as different games, developed by New FX and Technical Wave, respectively. If the name New FX sounds familiar to you, it was recently mentioned in my digital pinball video as they were the ones that made Crewball on the Sega Genesis. Being on weaker hardware, they decided to try to make it a bit more of a traditional platformer, which sounds good at first, but unfortunately it just plays a bit too clunky and has really bad music. A semi-sequel was released on all of these platforms in 1994 through 1996, but I say semi-sequel because it's the same character of Taz, but it's not tied to the Tasmania TV show. 1992 also saw the release of a Super Nintendo game, but this time it was developed by Visual Concepts and published by Sunsoft. For the Super Nintendo, Tasmania it has a completely different perspective. This time it's a third person view from behind while you're running down a road. You're gonna gather kiwis before time runs out and while avoiding obstacles. You can use the spin to avoid some of the obstacles, but it's gonna drain your health. The graphics are nice and bright and colorful as you would expect from a Super Nintendo game, and it's kind of a mix of like the outrun Space Harrier style and the use of Mode 7. The gameplay on the Super Nintendo Tasmania is a bit shallow and almost feels like it would be a bonus stage in some other game. There are bonus stages in this, but they still play pretty similarly to the ones that you would normally play. And also when he runs, it kind of just looks like he's got to take a crap really bad. There's also a coyote at some point that'll give you items from Acme, but he's not Wild E Coyote, and I don't know if that was a rights issue or just a decision that they made while making the game, but it's just kind of odd. This one was fun, but definitely more in short bursts. The final game to come out in the realm of Tasmania would be the Game Boy game that came out in 1993, known as Tasmania 2. Tasmania 2 was developed by Beam Software and published by THQ and is yet another platformer, 
but is also very fun to play. Gameplay is kind of a mix between Mario and Sonic as you will speedily run through the levels using your spin move, but not too much because you have a meter that drains as you use it. You can't jump on their heads, but you can collect a bunch of items, and as per usual, you get 100 and you get an extra life. Number 4 on the list is Defenders of Dinatron City, which was an animated pilot that wasn't picked up for a full series that aired on February 22, 1992. Voices in the cast include Tim Curry and Whoopi Goldberg, and Christopher Walken also voiced a character but unfortunately was re-recorded at the last minute with a different actor to be, quote, more cartoony. I cannot imagine a world where Christopher Walken was not cartoony enough. But anyway, I digress. It was later released on VHS, and it's about superheroes that protect a futuristic city against Dr. Mayhem and his robots. Dr. Mayhem created a cola that gave these people powers, and he's trying to use it to mutate everybody to make them under his control. These characters all appear in an NES game that was released in August of 1992 and developed by Lucasfilm Games, who we will know better as its later renamed LucasArts. Defenders of Dinatron City was also published by JVC, which makes sense because they published the other Lucas games of the era, and it was designed by Gary Winnick, who has made many classic Lucas games. This was the first one that he was the sole designer of. In the game, you're going to pick which character you want to play as, and you can keep going until they are captured. Once that happens, you can then choose a different character, and you keep going until all of them are gone. Unfortunately, this is another game with poor hit detection, and it also has an odd map that makes it easy to get lost. I just found it quite boring as you would wander around and not have enemies to go after. I feel like this is a game that you can get better at as you spend more time with it, but I wasn't compelled to do so. Next up is number 5 with Eek the Cat, which I feel was the game that Old Gamer Joe was looking forward to the most when playing. Eek the Cat ran for 5 seasons between 1992 and 1997 and was created by Savage Steve Holland, known for making the movies Better Off Dead and One Crazy Summer before moving on to other kids shows. It's about a purple cat that lives in Mictropolis and has the motto, it never hurts to help, but that motto usually gets him in trouble. The cartoon is full of a lot of physical and visual gags about him always getting hurt and injured, and it also was known for having other segments like the terrible Thunder Lizards. After being out for a couple seasons, in 1994 there was a game released for the Super Nintendo. It was developed by CTA Developments, which made the Blues Brothers game, and published by Ocean, which we all know as the LJN of Europe. Since Eek's motto was about helping people, that's what you do in the game. You help people get through the levels. You can take as much damage as you want, but it's the friends that have the health meter. As you walk around the levels, you can kick your friends to get them up to a higher level, which is just an odd way to help somebody, and really this game was just super frustrating. I couldn't make it very far in this, and Old Gamer Joe wasn't much more successful either. The character has a very poor design that looks nothing like Eek the Cat, and overall, everything is very dark. I almost thought something was wrong with my TV. All of this is kind of surprising because there's actually a really great intro to the game that makes it feel like you're going to actually get a good game from Ocean. But I guess we should have just known better. For number six on the list, it's going to be one of the more well-known properties as it is The Tick. The Tick ran for three seasons from 1994 to 1996 and was based on a comic book series that also saw two future live action adaptations. The story of The Tick is about The Tick, who does the tryouts of the National Super Institute. And he's assigned to The City, where he takes on Arthur, a former accountant turned hero, to be his sidekick. The Tick and Arthur have other superheroes that help them out as they take on various other bad guys. This leads to a Super Nintendo and Genesis game being released in 1994 from developer Software Creations. Software Creations made all kinds of games, but Carmageddon is the one that seems to always come to mind. It was published by Fox Interactive, and this was actually their first game and they would go on to make all different kinds of games based on other Fox properties like The Simpsons, Die Hard, Alien, and also non-properties like Croc. While I really wanted to be able to make videos that keep things more positive on this channel, unfortunately for The Tick, it's another boring-ass 2D brawler. It starts off by doing 2D side-scrolling platforming, but then it changes to that more slanted view of games like Streets of Rage and Final Fight when enemies appear. While it does nail the look and feel of the cartoon, the gameplay is just too generic to make it any fun at all. It kind of reminded me of playing something like Maximum Carnage, where you think that it's better than it actually is once you actually start playing it. 
You can call on Arthur to help you, and there's a few other things to mix things up, but overall, you just find it kind of mindless, and there are way better brawlers out there. And finally, we come to the last show on our list, and that would be for Spider-Man, a show that I'm sure many of you remember loving as a kid. It ran for five seasons from November 19th, 1994 to January 31st, 1998. This is two years after the success of the X-Men cartoon in 1992, which I don't know about you, but I'm pretty excited about how that's coming back with X-Men 97. The Spider-Man cartoon is about, well, Spider-Man. I mean, what more do you need to know? It's about Peter Parker with his special powers and fighting all the villains that you know from Marvel. There were two video games that were released that were based directly on the animated series, one for Super Nintendo in 1994 and one on Genesis in 1995. They were both developed by Western Technologies, which is known for making the X-Men game on Genesis, but unfortunately, don't expect that level of quality. It was published by Acclaim, which would use the Acclaim name on the Genesis, but the LJN name on Super Nintendo, so really you kind of know what you're getting into at that point. Both versions do share the same story of Dr. Octopus escaping prison and wants revenge on Spider-Man. At the same time, Oscorp goes bankrupt and the Green Goblin shows up again and teams up with Doc Ock along with other villains. While they do share the same story, the levels, enemies, and gameplay do differ between the two versions. Both of them are size scrolling platformers, but they do play a bit differently based on which platform it is. There are six levels in the Super Nintendo version, but only five in the Genesis version. The Super Nintendo one, especially Spider-Man, looks jacked! And the Genesis one does look a bit more like the X-Men game, which does make sense considering who developed it. The gameplay does end up being a bit awkward, and you definitely don't want to confuse it with the earlier Spider-Man Genesis game, which obviously has been later on to be known more as Spider-Man vs. the Kingpin to help differentiate it. Yes, I know that that was the title that would show up on the title screen, but the box didn't say that, and that kind of confused me as a kid when this later one came out. I thought it was just the same game being re-released, and boy was I wrong. So there you have it, seven different TV shows from Fox Kids that had video games based on them, and now we can kind of see why the Disney Afternoon games are looked at a bit more fondly. Sure, there was some fun to be had with a few of these games, but overall they were pretty lackluster, and this is why we have a stigma when it comes to licensed games. Now I pass it off to you. Were these games that you remember playing as a kid? Do you enjoy playing them? Am I way off base with this? Let us know in the comments below. And while you're at it, check us out over at patreon.com slash idreamofindiegames. Over there, as I said before, you can help support us. So thanks again for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.